So as you can tell, I'm not actually in Texas right now working on the love truck and I'm in Arizona at Total Seal Piston Rings and I came here to show you guys what exactly they do, uh, their manufacturing process and have them explain why piston rings are the number one thing that people overlook when building an engine. You can increase horsepower and decrease engine temperature just by changing your piston rings. Hi, this is Keith with Total Seal Piston Rings. Here we are, it's a beautiful sunny day in Arizona. Uh, I don't think you could ask for a lovelier day. Uh, this is Total Seal Piston Rings. We've been around since 1967. Uh, this was started by Joe Moriarty and his family. We started off manufacturing gapless piston rings back in those days, and we've grown it into 25,000 square feet of state-of-the-art manufacturing, and proud to say I truly believe we manufacture the best piston rings in the world. Let's go inside and I'll show you a little bit about how we do it. As you can see, this is a steel-based piston ring. You've got this nice round cam-shaped part. It's actually only round when it's closed in the cylinder. Right now, it's actually elliptical. But what you probably didn't know is it starts off like this. This is a coiled spool of steel. This happens to be M2 tool steel. And this is where this part starts life at. So we actually have a cam coiling system that's gonna take it from this to this in a matter of seconds. We've got a spool of stainless steel wire, as you can see coming through the guide into the coiling machine. And if you wanna come in here, you can actually see a sample part. They're just setting this up right now to do a new run of parts. You can actually see the ring coming through the guide rollers and it comes back around. This machine will actually cam coil this. And again, what I mean by a cam, the ring is not round. It's only round when it's in a closed position. Right now it's elliptical. And one of the things that we do that's very unique is we actually put the cam in the ring as it's going through the coiling process. Some people will do what's called round wire coiling. We do cam coiling and that's what this machine does. It actually does a cam in the ring so we don't have to put in additional steps. Really, truly the state of the art way to do this. So this is kind of cool because I didn't realize that it would start as that big of a spool of wire. But the one thing I want to know because there's so many spools of wire up there is how many rings are cut by this specific machine, say in a day, a week, or a month? We can typically do about 2,000 parts a day off of this machine. Really? So depending on how many, you know, we're working two shifts a day, five days a week, six days a week, depends on the workload in the shop. But on an average day, we can run about 2,000 parts a day off of this piece. That is crazy. Yeah, it's, that's, that's it's, a lot. She works a lot. She's been doing her job for a long time. Uh, it's been an excellent piece of equipment. We maintain it well, and it pays us back in big dividends. So what we've got next, this particular machine right here, you can kind of go in, it's not running around, but this is actually the profile. And this machine will actually put the face profile on the ring. We can put the taper in there. We can put the napier in there. So typically second rings can be done in here. We can do top rings as well if we're doing combination profiles. We can actually do you know, barrel with a combination leading edge. Uh, this is actually the, the profiler. Yeah. And we'll walk over here, because this one's running right now. This one is the gap sizer. This is what puts the end gap in the ring. It looks like it's being set up right now. No problem, we're doing great. How's it going, man? So what this machine's gonna do, is gonna be a stack of rings goes in here, and it's gonna take two rings at a time. It's gonna slide the table over, it's gonna bring the ring in, and with that end mill, we're going to come in and actually preset the end gap on this part. So we have our own specs that we have for our shelf parts, but if we have a customer that has a very specific desired part, I want this bore size, this end gap, we can generally hold within about 3,000 end gap coming off of this machine. That's awesome. And about like the profiles of, you know, the rings, you're talking about the chamfer and like the napier and all that. That'll be cool to get into later, you know, explaining what exactly, you know, the differences are and what those differences do. What those bevels do in the ring. We can actually go to the into the conference room and draw some stuff up for you and show you kind of what the chamfers do. Uh, it's a common misconception that the bevel's there to get gas pressure behind the ring, which is one of the things it does do, but it has other, we'll say, things that it does. It produces twist in the ring. We'll draw that out and show it to you. So one of the things that we have to do, and we do do here, I guess we don't have to do it, but we do, <laughs> is we OD lap the face of the ring so that your engine doesn't have to do it. And 
that process is done back here. As you see in the rack right here, we've got hundreds of cylinder sleeves, kind of like the cylinder of your engine, but these are honed, they're spiral cut, and there's actually a lapping compound that goes in here. And we're gonna place the ring in here. It's gonna go into this machine. This is the closing collar. This acts like a big ring compressor. We're gonna load the rings in, and it's gonna go in, and we've got this lapping compound. And that compound, we're gonna sit here and work that ring back and forth, kind of like a butter churn, and we're gonna lap the face of that ring and you get rid of all the little high spots and low spots, the little imperfections. That way your engine doesn't have to do it. We're gonna do it ahead of time for you right here. Yeah, it's, it's a necessary, it's what it takes to make this go to the next level. You know, a lot of manufacturing is done to certain types of specifications, and we like to go beyond those specs. You know, you've got this tolerance, that tolerance, you know, holding this particular profile, that. We want to take all this and have taken all this to that next level, going beyond the everyday specification. Tighter tolerance is better fit, light tight. That's what we're all about. What we've got here, one of the things that we do here is light tight inspection on our rings. And what that means is we're going to make sure that that ring, the circumference of that ring matches your cylinder. You're working with your honing guy to get a perfectly straight, perfectly round bore. Well, we've got to make sure that we manufacture a ring that matches that. So what we're going to do is we have a mercury gauge here. This is a tool that is, this particular one is, oh, where am I at here? I can't quite see anymore. Uh, 3.387. This is round to the million. It's accurate. We're going to put the light tight gauge in. Uh, this particular ring is not the right size, so you'll have to use a little bit of your imagination. And we're going to place that ring into the mercury gauge. We're going to use that to square it up. And then we're going to look for any kind of peripheral light between the ring gauge and the ring itself. What we're after is 100% light tight. We don't want any light. We want to make sure that ring matches perfectly. And this is actually something you can do in your own engine. You can take that ring. Let's say, for example, you put just the top ring on the piston. Put it in the cylinder, square it all up, take a nice bright floodlight underneath, shine that light up, and look for light between that ring and that cylinder. You want to make sure there's 100% contact. Sometimes you'll little see little pin dots, little specks of light. That's okay. That's a little, usually what I'll call a little tick turd in the cylinder. Mm. Uh, it'll go away as soon as you fire it. But there should never be areas, you know, a half inch long, three quarters of an inch long. Large areas not touching the bore. And that's a simple, easy check that you can do at home in your own engine. So what exactly would cause you know, a uh, space like that to be, you know, found in the ring. You know, if somebody was doing this at home. One um, of the things that does that is bending the ring. Uh, as, as hard as we try to make this part perfect, if we get overly aggressive putting the ring on and off the piston, overly aggressive when we're filing the ring, it's very easy to bend a ring. You can knock it out of shape real, real easy if you're not careful with it. Other things that can happen are, are in the engine itself. When the engine, if you get an engine extremely hot, we overheat it, we can start to anneal the ring, detonation, uh, hydraulic, an overly rich fuel system. You take an alcohol engine and fill that thing full of fuel, guess what? It's trying to hydraulic. That fuel is going to go somewhere. It'll bend a ring. And you can check that ring by light tight testing. So here, we pre check the rings to make sure they're light tight going out the door. When you get them at home, you can check it, make sure your bores are straight and round. And if you've got an engine that's giving you a little bit of fun, you know, a little bit, hey, you can always pull it apart light tight check it that's a great way to tell if that ring's still good if it's not good another thing we do here a little we'll call a little tech tip after you file fitted your rings one of the things you want to do is write down in your build book record this we call this the free gap how would you know what is that gap after i filed let's say for instance that's about five hundred thousandths of an inch which it probably is we run that engine we tear that engine back apart we want to listen to that engine i should say you know look at all the parts it's telling you a story if you're looking and one of the things that we can tell is if that gap, when it comes out, it's gonna close down a little bit, maybe 80, 100 thousandths. That's perfectly normal. But if it went in like that and it comes out like that, there's a problem. You've got heat. You've got something that's trying to collapse the rings. Or if it comes out and the ring tips look like that, you drop the tips down. Again, another little handy tip, you've got a heat issue. We've got something going on, detonation, overly hot, and or a ring material that's just not right for your engine. You know, this particular ring is made out of 440B stainless steel. If you've got, you know, 3,000 horsepower twin turbo, you're probably going to need tool steel. So if the tune-up's good in the engine, we're not knocking the plugs out of it, we're not knocking the head gaskets out, but yet the rings come out looking like that, you need a tougher base material for that ring. And a light tight test is one of the easy ways to tell how that ring's performing in your ring. So I'm also looking like while we're passing all this, yeah. all of these packages, I mean, 
The number one thing that a lot of manufacturers are having a problem with right now is being able to get product out. Are you guys really having that problem? Or? Uh, we're, we're shipping product. The biggest thing going on right now with every, just like everybody else, is a supply chain issue. Mm -hmm. Raw material's difficult to get right now. That rack that you were looking at with all the steel ring, you know, the wire back there, there's usually never any empty holes in that. There's more material usually stored outside in the storage containers. Raw material's an issue for everybody right now. We're feeling the same pain, but raw material's coming in on a daily basis. Uh, uh, there were just a couple crates here a minute ago that they just unloaded. So we've got material coming in every day of the week. Uh, everybody's got a little speed bump going on. Hopefully we keep ours to a real small one. But yeah, we're shipping every day. That's awesome. This is all, you know, you call up, you want to, you know, Oh, what is that one? A 4350 bore, 1616, 316, stopped O'Malley ring. There you go. They're ready to go right off the shelf. But one of the things that we do that we're a little different than everybody is, I like to say we build piston rings. We don't just build boxes. A lot of the companies out there, you know, there's a box of rings. This is what you want. This is how it comes. If you don't want it just like that, well, you can buy another box. And we can get another thing out of this box. They sell boxes. What we've got down here, This is open stock parts. This is all parts that are manufactured, they're done, they're ready to go. There's tens of thousands of part numbers out here from top rings, second rings, oil rings, expanders, oil rails. And one of the very unique things that we can do is we can mix and match everything together the way you want it. We'll box that set of rings, we'll make that box, but we'll make it the way you want it. I like to call us the Burger King of piston rings. We'll do it your way. It's just a matter of coming out here, I grab eight of these rings, eight of those rings, eight of these oil rings, put it together, and voila, you've got just what you want without having to buy excess parts. What we do here is the coatings that you see on the rings, if you look at the top and the bottom flanks, uh, the oxides and the phosphates that you see on a piston ring, those coatings are there as an anti-rust coating, and there's some lubrication characteristics behind as well. But they're dip coatings, they're liquid style coatings, and that's what gets done in here. Yep. I don't like to stay in here too long because I don't have a lot of hair on the top and I swear to God the hair falls out. I, I, I couldn't tell you that for sure, but I don't know, it kind of makes me nervous. <laughs> this is vibratory tumbling. Uh, we've got multiple stations in here that use plastic media to deburr everything. Uh, we've got a high barrel polisher outside. I can literally put a ring in that looks like that. It'll come out looking like chrome. Over here, we've got heat treat. We do our own heat treating in-house. We've got two heat treat ovens. Uh, this will run in a, a nitrogen atmosphere, so there's no oxygen in there. We can hit extremely high temperatures and yet control the rate. So all of our heat treating is done in-house. Hey, there you go. We all remember these. We played with them as kids. Slinky. It even makes the right sound. But what this is, this is your oil ring rails. This is how they start light. Round wire coiled. These particular ones have been chromed. And once we've cut them, you end up with oil ring rails. So that's how your oil ring rail starts out light and ends up as a finished product. But one of the things that we do differently is we don't cut them with a bandsaw. Most places use a saw blade. They take it, they take that coil, they slice it. We use wire EDM. So, kind of hard to see, but you can see there's an 8,000 thick electrically charged wire right there that we actually use to burn through that rail. And this way we can control a very, very tight end gap. Our oil rails are typically somewhere between 15 and 25 thousandths. Again, depends on the specification, depends on the end use of the part. But typically we run a very, very tight end gap on our oil rails. And one of the things, again, we do differently is we use an EEM to cut them, not a saw. So one thing that we were talking about earlier, Lake and I, was we were talking about the oiling rings and how it looks like that, there has that little uh, corrugated kind of looking section in between, which I learned is actually a spring. It's, um, it's, that's the expander, yes. Yeah, sir. and so where, when does that come into effect when you guys are manufacturing your Well, rings? that's one thing, I'll, I'll just straight up, we don't manufacture our own expanders. We're looking at doing our own expanders. We have a company that makes them for us. Uh, that will probably be one of the next things that we bring in house and start to do ourselves. Uh, things that we don't do, we're not a foundry, we don't make the metal ourselves, so I rely on outside suppliers. There's some coating processes we do in house, but there's other coating processes we do outside. And one of the other things we don't do is we don't manufacture our own expanders. They are all tested, batched, grouped together, so to make sure the tensions are correct. But at this time, we don't manufacture them, though we are looking at doing so. so that's the oil ring expander. As you can see, it's a corrugated spring. 
And just like a valve spring, it doesn't do anything until it's compressed together and squeezed down to make tension. So we're gonna take this, this right here, this machine's a tangential load tester. So we've got what I'll call is a simulated oil ring groove. This particular one happens to be 4090 bore three millimeter. And we're gonna put the expander in the groove, just like we would on a piston. Let the ends of the expander butt up. They're never supposed to overlap. They're always supposed to be butted. And then we're gonna take the two rails, the upper rail and the lower rail. And we're going to simply roll them into the grooves. So do the grooves have to line up uh, on the top and the bottom? Now the, yeah, the rails we generally off, some people like to offset the rails 180. Uh, we generally recommend about 90 degrees of separation. So we've got one over here, one over here. But as, you know, 90 to 180 is going to do the job. So, but one of the questions people ask me is the tension of the oil ring. They'll take them, pull them through a bore, and tell me, oh, you know, they'll use a fish scale. It took five pounds to pull it or six pounds to pull it. Well, the problem with measuring it that way is you're taking into consideration the bore finish. You're actually measuring sliding friction, not the force that it takes to compress the ring down to its given bore size. And that's what we're measuring, the pound force of what it takes to compress the part. So I've already set the machine up. We've got a little slip ring here. This is gonna pull down to 4090, and we're gonna read the pound feet that it takes to compress this part down to its given size. We're also gonna vibrate it and shake it, so we're eliminating any of the friction that's actually built in the tooling and just measuring the force that it takes to compress it down. And this particular one's a high tension three millimeter for 4090 bore. So it's gonna be somewhere in the 15, 16 pound range, somewhere in that neck of the woods. And here we go. And there's the, there's the force reading. So that particular part came in at about 16.2 pounds, which is right where it's supposed to be. And that's how we actually test oil ring tensions. All right, this is our lapping room. This is generally a, you know, a hands-off kind of a place. We don't show a lot of this. One of the things that we do differently than most of the other companies out there is we actually lap our rings to get the dimension, the thickness of that ring. When we talk about how thick the ring is and what kind of tolerance we can hold, many companies like to try to hold a plus or minus five, ten thousandths tolerance. And that's okay in a production engine, but when we're building race engines, where we're trying to hold clearances at three tenths, four ten thousandths, bottom line, we have to do better. And looking at traditional manufacturing ways, we didn't see we could you know, get those kinds of tolerances, couldn't hold it uh, the way it used to be done. So we developed a lapping process. We have a four stage lapping process that we use. We're gonna bring the rings in, gonna locate them into the plates, upper and lower lapping plates. Again, like we saw outside, the diamond lapping compound. And we're going to lap these rings into spec we can typically, coming off the early stages right here, hold about one and a half, ten thousandths tolerance. So plus or minus five, oh heck no, we're talking plus or minus one and a half. Significantly tighter, flatter, smoother surfaces on the rings. And the further we move down the line, we can actually get all the way down to holding 50 millionths of an inch tolerance. Incredibly tight. This is the level that you're at in Formula One, NASCAR, Pro Stock, those high-end applications where we're looking to have exceedingly tight ring tolerances. This is the way that we achieve it here at Total Seal, and we think we do it better than anybody else. One of the things you may or may not know, besides building piston rings, we build all our own tooling in-house. So if you need ring compressors, leak down testers, squaring tools, Power ring filers. This is the, the ring filer room. This is where we build all our power ring filers are built in this room. Uh, here's one down here. You can actually get a shot of an actual finished piece. It all starts right in here and it's all done right here at Total Seal. One of the newest things that we're doing here at Total Seal is our new gas ported top ring. Uh, this is the fixture and some of the tooling that we use to actually do the gas porting of the ring. These are parts that are, uh, yep, they're up next. So it looks like they're getting ready to be done. Uh, we're gonna have the fixtures gonna come down and hold the ring and then we're gonna gas port. Here's one that looks like it's actually been gas ported. Absolutely incredible difference in ring seal. Just had a gentleman call me this afternoon, tell me his little you know, 80 horse engine's up three, it was 89 horsepower, it's up three horsepower from where it used to be, going to the gas port ring, he couldn't be happier. Best ring seal he's ever had. Trust me folks, this thing works. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at it, it's, it's cool to see the little grooves and stuff cutting them. And we're actually gonna to talk to Lake in a minute about like what exactly those do and then all the different profiles on the rings and stuff, which I'm looking yeah. forward to people learning because a yeah. lot of people don't understand how important piston rings are to an engine. So it's it's cool how crazy they can be too. Like, it's, they all look really similar, but 
They're so different. Yeah, we're kind of like the last frontier. You know, people worked on intake manifolds and cylinder heads and, you know, the rotating assemblies and optimized every part. And it was always like, ah, I got to have that, got to have this. And, you know, ah, just, yeah, throw me some rings in there. Uh, you know, we're that next frontier. We're that next level in that part that really hasn't been that concentrated on for years. And it's every bit as important as anything else because if the ring's not doing the best job that it can, you're leaving power on the table. You're going to have blow by problems, oil control problems. And we're doing everything we can to correct that and help educate everybody yeah you know, these are the things that have to be done so come on in let's go talk to lake so this is kind of funny because I'm sitting at this desk and it feels like I'm back in high school or college but uh, we just showed you how it's made and now I'm gonna have lake explain why it's made the way that they're doing it and kind of like some of the science behind you know what you guys are doing so if you want to take it away yeah sure so I'm Lake Speed Jr. And here at Total Seal, I'm kind of the resident tribologist. And you may not have heard the word tribology before, but it's the study of friction, wear, and lubrication. Now, you may be wondering, what does that have to do with the piston ring? Well, here's a little fun fact for you. The piston ring accounts for about 40% of all engine friction. Yeah, hit pause, rewind that again, 40% of all engine friction. So it's the number one source of friction in your engine. So, you know, the camshaft guys and the cylinder head guys, they get all the glory when it comes to making horsepower. Because that's about getting air into the engine. All right, so you take that air, you mix it with the fuel, and you burn it to make power. But where does that power go? How much of that power actually makes it to the crankshaft? Well, 40% of all engine friction is the piston ring, so guess what? If you want to increase the efficiency of your engine, piston rings are a pretty good place to start. And I spent you know, almost 15 years working at Joe Gibbs Racing, one of the top NASCAR teams, and my boss was our head engine builder. And my job was being in charge of tribology. So we worked on friction, wear, and lubrication. We developed our own oils. We worked with the guys here at Total Seal. So I knew about Total Seal and was working with Total Seal way before I ever came to work at Total Seal. And what we were doing, we were focusing on the types and designs, the sizes, the materials of the piston rings. So he showed you how we make piston rings. I'm gonna tell you why piston rings are incredibly important. And we all love horsepower. So one thing you can do is make the piston rings smaller. So what I've drawn here on the board are some different types of piston rings. So a typical piston ring package is going to be three different rings. You're going to have a compression ring, what they call the upper compression ring, top ring. Then you're going to have a second ring or a lower uh, uh, compression ring. And there's two different types that I've drawn here. This is a taper face, and you can kind of see that angle on there. And this is a, called a napier. So it's got this little hook on the front of the ring, because that second ring, its job is actually to scrape oil. And then you got your oil control ring, which is a three-piece style, which Keith was showing you how they make the oil control rings, and they've got the tension testing and all that. So that spring is back here, your oil rail to here, and it's doing what's called your gross oil control. It's scraping off the majority of the oil. The second ring, its job is 80-20. So it's 80% fine oil control, because here's the deal. If you scraped all the oil off the cylinder wall, then your top compression ring will run dry. And that's bad for two reasons. Number one, if there's no lubrication, it's gonna wear out. But number two, oil is the gasket between the ring and the cylinder wall. You wouldn't put together a small block Chevy or an LS or any engine for that matter and not put a gasket between the cylinder head and the engine block and expect it to seal up. Something's got to be there to give, to take up for those variations in spaces. Well, that's what the oil does. So oil is the gasket, helps it seal, and it's the lubricant. So that second ring's job is to leave just enough oil for that compression ring to be lubricated and to seal, but not so much oil left in the combustion chamber that it burns because oil is also a hydrocarbon, just like gasoline is, and it will burn. But unfortunately, 
As a chemistry guy, I can tell you, oil has a lower octane value than your fuel. So you don't want that because that can cause detonation in bad things. Like you don't want holes in your pistons and things like that. So we want oil in the crankcase, not in the combustion chamber. And that's the job of the oil ring package is to keep compression gases up here, keep the oil down here. Then here, we can be mad scientists and go even further. We can do things like having zero gap, gapless rings, which essentially is two interlocking rings, so there's no end gap, which is really great for boosted applications or things running, say, methanol or E85, where there's so much fuel trying to get into the crankcase. Well, every one of those gaps is a leak path to let that fuel get to the crankcase, and fuel is the enemy of your oil. So there's a way to do it. And we also have some other cool technology like putting gas ports in the ring. Because as Keith mentioned, rings are gas activated. It's the gas pressure getting behind the ring that pushes the ring against the cylinder wall. It's not the tension of the ring itself that seals it. It's the gas pressure. And if we put a, a groove in here, guess what it does? It allows that gas pressure to get behind the ring and push out against it. Now most people just think, ah, you know, I got this piston and I'll just use whatever rings that come with it. And they kind of overlook the performance ability. If I told you you could pick up 25 horsepower and lower your water temperature 20 degrees just by changing your piston ring size, you might reconsider what size piston rings and what pistons you're gonna buy because I can tell you for a fact, we've proven it over and over again you can increase horsepower and decrease engine temperature just by changing your piston rings. When somebody has a question, you know, mm -hmm. for a specific application, like for me, you know, right. let's say who's running a pretty standard 5.3 liter junkyard LS motor sure. that, you know, I will be building into, you know, possibly a boosted application, like a, you know, running a single turbo or something. Right. You know, but no matter what anybody is running, they can call you guys. Oh yeah, we're always here, right? I mean, so that's the great thing. Keith always says, make us your first call, not your last call. Huh. You know, so before you buy parts, you know, give us a call. You know, you can send us an email. So you can go to totalseal.com. There's a thing called request a ring. You can lay out all your information and that comes to us and one of us is gonna answer it. Or you can pick up the phone, call us 623-587-7400 is the main number. And I mean, between the four sales guys here, there's over a hundred years of engine building experience. But I, I really appreciate, you know, all the knowledge that Total Seal has been able to give me on piston rings because when I came in here, I had no clue how intricate any of this stuff was. Yeah. And so it's cool to learn and to realize just how important something that is so overlooked so commonly is so important to, like you said, making power. Because, and another thing that you said is the friction being 40% in your engine from the piston rings, yep. that's, that's crazy. It's, 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 a, it's huge, the lowest hanging fruit, right? If you want to reduce friction in your engine, the first thing you're gonna go is look there. But let's even say for your junkyard LS build. Okay, so let's say you keep the factory piston and rod assembly because, hey, we know it can handle a good amount of power, but an easy way to upgrade that package to make it more reliable yeah. is just swap the piston rings in it. Yeah. Put a gas ported ring in, because your pistons aren't gas ported. Put a gas ported ring in it, and now guess what? You've upgraded your piston. Oh, I'm gonna put boost to it. Okay, well I put boost to it, I need a little bit thicker oil. Well, that factory LS engine, that oil ring piston was made for a 5W30. Yeah. But now I'm putting boost to it, if I go to say a 15W40 to handle the boost, I need to bump up more ring tension. And as Keith already said, so we do. We can make custom piston ring packages, not just for custom pistons, we do them every day for just off the shelf OEM pistons. This is an easy way to make a little more power, a little better durability for your engine, because here we love engines and piston rings are just one way that we can help racers, help enthusiasts, make a little more power, and have a little better durability. I had an absolute blast coming to Total Steel Piston Rings and learning how they manufacture their rings and the science that goes into creating the best piston ring for any engine application. And I cannot wait to run their piston rings in the uh, LS that I'm running in my love truck. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please let me know if you guys want to see more videos like this. I have a couple more coming out actually this month. 
uh, that are similar to this one. I have one coming out specifically from Bear Brakes where I show you guys how the XTR caliper is manufactured and designed, which is the caliper that is going on the love. But if you guys wouldn't mind liking and subscribing, I would really appreciate it and I will see you guys next time.